my issue last week, and I, on, I know I didn't have any meetings started, but so uh, um, yeah. I'm not sure what why it said that, and I occasionally get that error, and I just say end the other meeting, um, but then nobody was here, and my email said people were waiting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So when I started it, it must have kicked you guys out for some reason temporarily. Yeah, I guess so. But we we figured it out. So Very strange. Okay, so the I just wanted to talk a little bit about the labs this week. Um, so, oh wait a second. So, um, the Windows Lab, you know, it says run the Ma Microsoft Baseline Security Analyzer. And I looked this up, um, and I found a link that said, you know, here's, here's the version that you want for Windows 10. And I just to be sure, I followed the link, and Microsoft has pulled the link. And, peop and I see questions in forums about, where is it? So I don't know if there was a um, an issue with it or or what. That's a lab nine or a hands-on lab nine. Right. So that's that's for a. Uh, I'm seeing that as for something for next week. Um, that. Yeah, that's this is the upcoming. Got okay. I thought we were talking about a backlog. My bad. Nope, that's fine. And so I found this um, right down here. And it's, um, so this is an article with uh, six, I think, alternatives to baseline security analyzer. So if you have something earlier than 10 and you can find the download, it should work just fine. But the one that, the, the link that I found that said the version that works with 10 is here uh that link <clears throat> doesn't work at microsoft anymore so um there is this article with several alternatives to the security analyzer and uh so you can use any of those rather than secure you know mbsa you know it, and if you're not using 10 and you have access to mbsa it's fine to use mbsa uh the point is really to get the security of your system analyzed you know and it, it it does a few different things uh whether or not you're um well it says right here identify user accounts to the blank simple passwords firewall status how many administrators you have whether you have unnecessary um so you know it's a, it's a handy you know these kinds of things are handy tools and it's fairly simple to run so there's that. I don't think there's really anything else to say about that one. Um, you know, and if you decide that you want to try more than one and give a little review, have at it. You know, the I think that the homework this week is not overly complicated. I'm going to go through TCP wrappers. Um, TCP wrappers is actually not very hard but i'm gonna i'm gonna kind of walk you through it a little bit and uh you know and if you don't feel like doing a review that's not required that's not the expectation at all but you know if you're one of those curious types is like what's the best one <laughs> have at it so now i'm gonna tell me if when i change my tab if uh the screen changes along with it. Let's see. I need to get rid of that one. Um, did the screen change? Yeah, you're good. Okay. So I added a TCP wrappers how to. I used to have one here. And then when I was looking at the assignments for the upcoming week, I was like, where did it go? <laughs> so when I updated the the... You know, I, I completely redid it for this round of security. I must have accidentally removed the TCP wrappers how to. So this is a current TCP wrappers how to. And I have it open over here. 
so. Um, before Linux had its own firewall, you know, T TCP wrappers is an access control list, which is a similar idea to a firewall. And uh, now not all services in Linux use TCP wrappers, but it's, um, there are two files inside of Etsy. There's the host.allow and the host.deny. The host.allow takes preference. So if you said deny all and allow all, everything's allowed, um, which is kind of the opposite of um, some other at network access control lists. Like the thing that is true that's similar to the Cisco access control lists, um, you know, in the Cisco access control lists, unless things have changed, the rules are all in one file, but it will parse the rules and it'll take the first one and apply it. So if you had a deny before and allow, things are gonna be denied. And uh, that may not be what you really want. Um, so in, um, in Linux with the host, with the two files, it parses the allow first and any rules that are in the allow, it applies. So if you're saying allow all, it doesn't matter what you have in the deny. If you're if you're allowing all all, it, it won't parse the deny because those that rule would apply to everything. Um, but if you're applying a rule to specific hosts, and then it doesn't see anything referencing in the allow to other hosts and then there's a reference to those hosts in the deny file, then that um, rule would be parsed in the deny file. Um, by default, uh, the files are empty. Now, there, in earlier days in Linux, there's, there's a, a super server. The modern one is called Zynetd. Uh, the earlier one was called Inetd. And m when Inetd was used, more services took advantage of TCP wrappers. And when Zynet D was introduced, Zynet D provided some TCP wrappers like functionality. And um, so some of the services that used to use TCP wrappers switched over to using the ones provided by uh, Zynet D. Um, but FTP and SSH both use TCP wrappers. There are others that use TCP wrappers. Um, and then there are services that don't run through Zynet D that, and don't use TCP wrappers, but they, if they don't use TCP wrappers, they provide their own access control functionality. For example, uh, Samba, which makes a Linux box look like a Windows file server has its own access controls built in. So if you wanted to deny access to a particular subnet or a particular host, you can do that inside the Samba config file. Uh, Apache also has um, built in functionality. Uh, and there is one of the nice things is that in this how to, which I hadn't come across this before, um, there's a nifty little command. Where is it? Um, so there's the host allow. Oh, yeah, right here. Uh, I didn't know about this command. You can find out if something uses TCP wrappers by issuing this command, you know, you need to figure, you know what the path is to the binary. Uh, most binaries reside in a, um, in a subdirectory of slash uh, USR, which looks like slash user. And people think that that means that's, you know, if you're not familiar with Linux, you might think, oh, that's where the, users directories are, but no binaries live in user or a subdirectory user. Um, 
And then you can, so if you pipe it to grep librap, you'll find out whether or not, um, if you don't know whether or not the service takes advantage of TCP wrappers. Now, if, um, if I have a service running on the internet, I typically would run both the firewall and if the, if the service uses TCP wrappers, I would also run TCP wrappers. If I'm into really restricting uh, who can access what. So, you know, if I only wanted, you know, certain hosts to be able to SSH into my server on the internet, if they all had fixed IP addresses, I would put an allow rule in for those fixed IP addresses. And then I would put a deny rule in for everybody else. Uh, and that, you know, kind of enhances the safety. You know, one of the things, the moment you put a host live on the internet, people are knocking on the door all the time. And if they see that you're running a service like SSH, most, you know, they're gonna, the, most people, you know, they might be running bots that are doing this automatically, but they're going to knock on the door and they're going to try to log in as root and, you know, and do um, a brute force, you know, tr attempt at password cracking, a dictionary attack. And, uh, you know, when I've had hosts with TCP, uh, with SSHD open on the internet, and I go and look at the security logs, I just see constant attempts to get in. And uh, the, another way you can avoid that is to do um, a key exchange so that there's never a username and password. If you don't have the key, you can't get in. But TCP wrappers is if first, you know, if you didn't want to, if you really wanted to lock things down to a limited number of hosts, TCP wrappers is the way to go. Um, for any service that's supported by TCP wrappers. And the syntax is um, pretty simple. So, you know, you have the service colon the clients colon what the options are, you know, and you can have separate the options out. Um, you can set up the rule with a comma um separated list of services i would only do that if i wanted to apply ex the exact same rules to them you know if i were had multiple services that i was using tcp wrappers for i would actually and ha and had different rules for each of them i would put them on a separate line and not do a comma separated list the, the comma separated list is only useful if you want to apply the same rule to all of those services. And the clients, you can do host names, IP addresses that are affected by the rule, all matches everything. Um, local matches hosts that don't, you know, without a period in their fully qualified domain name like localhost. Um, known hosts, that situation with the host name of the host address of the or the user are known unknown is the opposite of known paranoid this is kind of this is a cool feature you know it'll drop a connection if you can't do a reverse dns lookup now obviously if you're on a lan you probably would not want to use paranoid because you probably don't have uh all your clients with unless you're doing dynamic DNS so that everybody winds up with a fully qualified domain name and then you would be able to do a reverse lookup. Uh, typically on a LAN, you're not doing everybody with a fully qualified domain name. And if you used Paranoid and it couldn't do a reverse lookup on the IP address, then uh, nobody's getting in. <laughs> so um, I would use Paranoid for something that's on the internet. Um, yeah, so, and then point out, I already said this, Etsy allow takes precedence over, uh, host.allow takes precedence over host.deny. 
Um, and it does r tell you that not everything supports TCP wrappers. I think it would make more sense if rather than some of the um, service services doing their own built-in access control, if, if they uh, just supported TCP wrappers. But I suppose with something like Apache, which runs in Windows, and TCP wrappers isn't in Windows, I guess Apache does need to have its own. But Samba is a Linux Unix thing. And that would make sense for Samba to use TCP wrappers, but they have their own. Um, so here they have an example. You allow SSH and FTP only to this host and local host, and you deny it to everybody else. So there's the SSHD, VSFTB, um, all you know, so it's denying all, and then you add this line to the host.allow. So when it sees an attempt to access from 192.168.0.102, it's going to parse the rule. It's going to allow it. It won't even look at the deny file. But if the IP address is not 102 and it's not localhost, then it'll parse the deny and see that it's denied. So it's fairly simple and straightforward. Um, and the assignment, let me just hop back to that. It, it's specifically to experiment with blocking and allowing SH, SSHD. And I remind you that host.allow takes precedence over host.deny and uh, yeah, so that's that assignment. It it it's fairly simple. Uh, you know, you can use Nano or or Vi to edit um, the files inside of Etsy. Uh, are there any questions about that one? Okay. All right. So the last thing I want to talk about because this is I'm traveling uh, the week of the exam. And um, and I'm not going to be um, available for a good chunk of the week that the exam runs. So I'm traveling Saturday, late Saturday afternoon, and then I'm I'm back home um, the following Saturday afternoon, and I'm not really going to have internet access. So. What I'm going to do um, with the exam, I'm going to set it set up or will be set up for multiple attempts, but only the first completed attempt is the one that gets the grade. Uh, there is a, a time limit. And for any of you that may have um, an accommodation for extra time, um, let me know if you don't think my time limit is adequate. So, you know, the CompTIA exams, they have a 90 minute time limit and 90 questions typically. And my, my, my exam is a hundred questions. And so I usually give, um, a hundred minutes for the exam. So it's one minute per question. Um, which for a lot of questions is way more than adequate. You know, if, um, so if, uh, if you don't think that's adequate, just, you know, shoot me an email or, or, um, you know, or ask to, to conference and we can talk about it. Uh, so it's a hundred questions. You know, it's worth looking at uh, your midterm because some of those questions will reappear. It is cumulative. Um, and then I would look at the summary questions at the end of the chapter. Some of the questions are going to be based on those summary questions. Um, and there may be some questions or there will definitely be some questions that 
are applicable to the material that are not necessarily from the the chapter review summary questions uh and i try to give them in a comp tia format comp tia loves to give scenarios i think i talked about this before the midterm so don't put something into the scenario that's not there um which is really the more experience you have the easier it is to do that uh you know you can, th you can think of a situation you were in it was like well i did this but you know the the conditions were different and so make sure that you have your head wrapped around if it's a if it's a scenario question make sure you have your head wrapped around exactly what the scenario is before you answer the question so uh for example you know uh let's say you wanted to break your network up into smaller networks but it's all you know you're in a large building and you know you, you're you're exceeding a thousand twenty four hosts which is the maximum number that you could have on an ethernet network and you would never want to go that far um because your performance would be horrible well before you got 1024 so you wanted to break your network up into smaller networks um you could you know put routers in um most places would not do that they would use like <coughs> three switches and create vlans um so vlans perform routing function functions but they're optimized for switching rather than optimized for routing and that would be a more appropriate device uh if you were all in the same building you know and it had been a flat network that you're breaking into multiple subnets uh you could do it with routers you know um, you know that's not technically that's not an incorrect answer but uh layer three switches would be the optimal <clears throat> tool in that environment and so you know if 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 the question is you know what tool could you use to accomplish this and it's a multiple answer you know then you would say oh well you know we could use <coughs> we could use layer three switches um if the question was like choose the best one to accomplish the task then the answer would definitely be layer three switches um so you know make sure that you're fully aware of what the question is asking before you you know it'd be pretty pretty easy to jump in and say router and uh and tech and you could do it that way but that if it says you know if the if the scenario question said choose the op most optimal way to accomplish this um router would not be the correct answer so um i think you know that you know it's going to be very similar to the midterm so you've you've taken the midterm um so i don't think there'll be any surprises there um luke had sent me some questions about uh some of the midterm questions and uh I will, um, so I think I had a duplicate question and a couple of other things. So those will all be um, addressed if, if, the, if I felt agreed that the question was a bad question or uh, so, yeah, that'll all be addressed in the, the final exam. Um, so let's move on to project presentation. So Wednesday, is the last group conference for this class because then we have the exam week and I, as i said i'm traveling during the exam week and then we're into the final project presentations the last week of class and uh and i'll send a note out um before i leave and then i'll send another note if i haven't heard from people as soon as i get back to start scheduling conferences for 
final project presentations. And I have two classes running. So uh, I have to schedule a lot of individual um, conferences to do project presentations. Now, when you, um, for your final um, policy, you know, make it look like it's a finished product that you are proposing for adoption. You know, some people are still leaving the, the SANS logo in there and the free use disclaimer. It should look like it's your policy. You know, you don't have to credit mm -hmm. SANS. You don't have to mention SANS at all uh, in in the policy. And, and so if you, you know, if you want to, amend the free use disclaimer so that it, where it says oh if you think there are issues with the policy you know contact blah 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 at our organization that's fine um but don't have leave the free use disclaimer that says uh, you know i think it's contact steven at sands or something like that uh don't leave that in there and mm -hmm. it, you know and in the um emergency response template you know it, it unlike some of the other templates it had several in section 4.1 i put a note out about this yesterday uh it says you know who's response you know the 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 policy you know who would be talking to the media who would be doing this and and many people left the template as is there and because it's a sample they're telling you what you need to put in there, but they can't put that in effectively for the sample. So you actually need to answer those questions. So I asked a, a whole bunch of people to to resubmit that because a lot of people left the questions in there as was without kind of addressing it. So um, I think I was one of those people. Um, when I had originally read that policy, Yep. I thought that the policy was in context to like the questions they would be asking, like right. For whatever is yeah, that was the policy should be defining there. so that if you you know if you're in a crisis, you pick up the policy and it's like, okay, we we've had a um, a breach. Who do I call? Ghostbusters. Okay. <laughs> um. uh, and so for those like numbers, since we are doing it for hypothetical companies, should it be for? equally hypothetical like yes yes yeah, okay totally. so like we can make up our own like contact guys we don't need to you go know, like researching for the actual specify names you could specify people by title you okay. know so um you know so that you know our first call is to um you know our it supervisor you know the uh, if the it and, like, supervisor is not available we call the you know, the head of security, if the head of security is not available, we, you know, you just kind of go up the food chain um, so that, um, you know, that they're notified. Gotcha. And uh, yeah, just so that, yeah, as I said, you don't need to specify anybody by name. If you want to, you can, if you want to, you know, some people have fun with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I One of your classmates is uh is doing for their scenario riverdale high school i don't know if any of you have watched the show riverdale you know it's based on the archie comics but it's really dark as opposed to the archie comics which were just funny um, Oh wow so anyway you could uh you know if you were having fun with it you could include some of the characters from the show you know and i had somebody a couple of years ago uh, they did their security policy for the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. <laughs> and they had a lot of fun with it. That would be especially relevant given what's coming up. <laughs> so, um, you know, but you don't have to do that either. You know, if you want to just specify by job title, that's fine. Gotcha. Um, and a lot of you that are doing school scenarios, you know, if it's something that can't be solved by the IT staff, you know, they may... They may not have an IT superior, and at which point they would most likely be calling in a consultant or law enforcement. And so, in the breach, you know, for a security breach, if you're doing the school scenario, you know, you could 
specify that depending upon the nature of the breach do you call law enforcement or do you call call in a consultant to help you solve the problem uh, but when it you know when when you present it all of the you can consolidate the, all of the policies into one large document if you want and when we talk you know if you've pretty much left it as is other than you know changing the company name you could say i was satisfied with this policy as is and i might say yeah i agree with you or i might challenge you and say did you think about this or think about that um and and we'll move on you don't need to get what when you present your policy i'm most interested in what you decided needed to be changed did you need to strengthen something did you need to weaken something because you're a small organization and you don't really have the teeth to to follow through on or the or the person power to police it um you know and and that's fine that's a reality you know if you if you weaken something because you know you don't have as high a security need or you just don't see it as enforceable um you know on the other hand if you're really not okay with it even if you don't feel like you can enforce it if it's written into the policy that it's not okay then if there is an issue uh if it's in the policy and it's it's really egregious you can address it even if you can't aren't capable of policing it for every person in the organization if it's if it's so far out there that you're like this we we can't let this go it it's gotten gotten onto our radar we're going to deal with it that's fine um so you know so typically these presentations you can kind of think you know they're all one-on-one -on -one. uh some people that have made significant changes i've been i've done conferences for over an hour people with smaller numbers of changes anywhere from 15 minutes to half an hour um i think because i changed how i did my quizzes so that you're doing some of the policies as going along because i wanted people to be a little more thoughtful you know there were some folks in the past when for the final project the you know they would blow through the policies in a couple of days and not always be thoughtful enough and uh I'm kind of like, ah, you, just, you know, you could have thought about this a little more. You've, you've had a little more time to live with it and, and think about it. And, and some of them are pretty cut and dried. And some of them, maybe not so much. So, and we're almost out of time. I did see my warning a, a little, a few minutes ago. So I don't know if I'm going to get cut off or not. Uh, are there any questions? I think I'm all good. Okay. So I'll send a note out about that. And, you know, generally speaking, I think the week that we have the project presentations, my evenings are fairly flexible. And so um, I should be able to schedule people uh, without too much trouble. I'm, you know, I'm through my busiest time of the year. Uh, and so I'm, I'm home at more reasonable hours now. <laughs> All righty. Okay. All right. Well, maybe I'll see some of you Wednesday, and, you know, and if uh, I'll probably be talking about similar stuff, but if you've run into a roadblock with any of the assignments, you know, by all means, uh, stop in, bring it up and we can go over it. Sounds good. All right. Have a good night. You, you too. too.